But what I want to talk about are kind of the unique circumstances that we're faced with with wolves in Yellowstone. Um, because wolves, it's probably the best place in the world to do free ranging wolves. And that's a wonderful thing, and it's also got a lot of responsibility that goes with it, both for the Park Service and for the public who come to Yellowstone to, to enjoy wolves. And that really is half the purpose for Yellowstone National Park, is to come and enjoy the place and enjoy the wildlife. But the flip side of that is to allow the animals to lead uh, normal and natural lives. And that's really difficult for the National Park Service, you know, when four million people a year are, are coming to the park. And a lot of the winter visitation, um, I don't know what it is, 100,000 or, 100, or so, um, you know, come, and a lot of them are coming just to see wolves. And so there's a lot of concentrated activity in the winter. I mean, I used to work in Isle Royale National Park, and the entire year's visitation is 13 to 15,000 people. And so just to give you an idea of the contrast in numbers. So that's, that's a difficult thing for us to uh, deal with, is to enjoy the park and the wildlife and allow them to have natural and normal lives. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of burden on, on visitors. So we've got policies about wildlife and the policies about wolves are more stringent, uh, along with bears. For example, you're not allowed to approach any wildlife closer than 25 yards. And wolves and bears has got to be 100 or change their natural behavior. So that's kind of a caveat that you need to pay attention to because you can change their natural behavior at any distance. Um, so you need to pay attention to that. There's not a hard and fast line out there, but you cannot get closer than 100 yards. And the regulation says you should maintain that distance. So if the animal gets closer, then you need to back up. And in short, that's the best thing I can say, that if you maintain that distance, humans aren't going to get hurt, and wolves won't get hurt or have to be hazed or have to be killed. Because we have killed two wolves in Yellowstone, and we've hazed a lot because these boundaries or situations are, for one reason or another, and some of them are difficult to help, uh, don't occur. And so that's our goal is to, if you keep that distance, the wildlife, uh, and in this case the wolves, and the humans benefit. And so that really is kind of our fundamental thing that we want to communicate. And as Abby said, there are similarities between wolves and bears. Um, they're both, you know, like every creature driven by food. And so, like a bear, if a wolf gets food, it's the beginning of the end. Because then they learn it's easy, they'll want to do it, and, and food conditioning is the, the quickest, fastest way to lead to habituation. Um, Mark McNay, who retired from the Department of Alaska Game and Fish, wrote a paper, um, and he analyzed all the wolf-human um, attacks in the 20th century, so he stopped at year 2000, 100 years, there were no fatalities, since then, there's been two, and there were, I forget, I should have looked it up today, 20 or 22 attacks from non-rabid wolves, and most of those were habituated, most of the habituation, although not all, most of the habituation occurred through food conditioning. And so, just like bears, if they get food, they're going to hook on to you and um, start associating with you and, and could lose their fear of you. Wolves are kind of... How do I say it different than cougars and bears? I'm not trying to single bears and cougars out, but wolves seem to have this built-in wariness or fear, as Abby said in many of her examples, of people. Um, I don't know if it's standing on two legs or what, but you know, their first encounters with people, and actually sometimes their lifetime encounters with people, they just don't like you. And if you give them food, it wears that down. And pretty soon, you know, you turn around in a pullout and a wolf's standing right behind you. Because someone fed it and it's lost its natural fear of people. So, that's kind of what habituation is. Um, I, I don't want to say all, because someone will find an exception, but virtually all wildlife is wary of people. And when they lose that wariness, when wolves lose that fearfulness of you, that's habituation. And how do you tell? Well, I think it's common sense. You can just observe their behavior. They hook onto you. They see you. 
instead of crossing the road. And by the way, it's hard to be wildlife in Yellowstone with all those people. Um, an animal uh, has to cross the road with all this traffic. And so we on the Yellowstone Wolf Project, you know, we like to refer to some wolves as, as tolerant of people. That's not habituated. The third category is truly wild. And that's probably wolves that live in a human matrix, like Abby was talking about, Alaska and Northern Canada. They're always wary of people because, you know, they're getting shot at more regularly, at least compared to Yellowstone. So Yellowstone, if you want to live there and do business there, you've got to deal and confront people. So they're going to be tolerant of you, but that's not necessarily habituated. So you need to give them that space to avoid you, yet at the same time get by you without incident. If they stop, walk towards you, hook onto you, that's the type of behavior that we do not like to see. And so the thing for you to do is to not allow that to happen. And you increase the distance, like they tell you with a grizzly bear or a black bear. You know, you see it out there. If you can manage that situation by increasing the distance between you and that animal, you do that. Same thing with wolves. And you don't run. Because all predators, if you run, <laughs> they're going to chase you. It's just built-in hardwired behavior. Try it with your dog. It's almost guaranteed they're going to run after you. So, you know, you want to move slowly away. And the human safety threat with wolves is not like it is with bears. You know, they're, you know, move away, increase that distance, don't run, they come towards you, yell, group up with whoever's with you. Hopefully there is someone, look big, flare your clothing, um, you know, and continue to move away. Get in your car. Um, but don't run. Use your bear spray like you would uh, with a bear. And so that's kind of a inside the park encounter. And, and I don't need to repeat what Abby said, but really all of us who work a lot with wolves, there's a lot of people here at Yellowstone Wolf Project and thinking of who they are, can, can also add to this because this is a, a team effort. But we're really not that, how do I say it, concerned. I mean, I'm more nervous around elk and bison than I am wolves, you know, especially walking around Mammoth in the spring. You know, and, and wolves really don't want to be around you. Uh, they don't want to bother you. So just kind of work with that and use that to your advantage. Now, the hard part with this comes up with, um, you know, we all love to see them. And we love to see them at close range. And so um, to deal with this, uh, we have hazed the wolves quite a bit. Um, we've killed two, uh, probably, you know, got some food, uh, and then lost their fear and started hoping on the people, as I explained. Um, and then a, another situation that has come up recently that we have to worry about is exposure to young pups to people. Uh, and this happened with the Junction Butte Pack this summer. Uh, they denned on a trail near Slough Creek, and the pups were exposed to people at a very young age. And now those pups, bigger animals, are, are, there's wariness issues with people. Uh, they're walking down the road, uh, they're close to people, and now we're in a situation where we gotta haze these wolves uh, because they achieved, or they were exposed to people when they were puppies, little. And in preparation for this talk, uh, I called Banff National Park today. And I, I've been in loose touch with them for 20 years, and just the earful of stuff I got from them was, you know, oh my gosh, if you're talking to a, a town full of people who live close to wolves, emphasize to them that we've lost eight, we've had to kill over a dozen wolves in the last 10, 20 years. They've had four occasions where wolf pups have been exposed to people in rendezvous sites and den sites. And then when they turned to be yearling wolves, they were in campgrounds. Some of these campgrounds have a thousand sites in them, it's a very big park, very popular park, and they've had to wipe out entire packs because they could not uh, stop these behaviors that the wolves had gotten because they're exposed to people as pups. And they had three other packs where they've had to kill individuals in the packs, so it was four separate incidences where rendezvous sites, dens, 
people um, got too close to the pups. The pups immediately at a young age learned that people weren't bad. And when this animal gets to be 70 to 90 pounds, even sometimes 100 the next year, they're an uncontrollable problem. And hazing doesn't work. And right now, that's the situation that we're faced with. And it's hard to do. It's hard to get them at the right moment, the teachable moment, um, and get the right wolves. Uh, and do it amidst a crowd of people. And so, um, you know, so everybody's safe. These are non-lethal munitions, as Abby talked about. But the last resort will be lethal. You know, we'll remove the wolf. Uh, if the behaviors continue and there's a human safety threat which we still feel is low, but we will be preventative when it comes to um, taking out that wolf. Uh, in other words, not allowing that behavior uh, to escalate. So really what it comes down to is the simplest of things, is to, is to maintain those distances, to not allow food conditioning to occur, um, to self-police. Um, you know, we spent time on those trails around Slough Creek this summer trying to condition those pups. And we got a little bit of aversive conditioning done, but apparently not enough. And so this is something that we need the public's help on. Um, to help, and we're not asking the public to aversively condition, because although the, the safety threat to wolves is almost zero, uh, it's not actually zero. As I said, Mark McNay, uh, you know, had 20, 22 cases in the 20th century, people got in injured. And since that time, there's been two fatalities. Uh, one in North Saskatchewan, and those wolves were dump wolves feeding around a dump. And another one on the Alaska Peninsula, again, on a road to a dump, a woman running with earbuds, so she couldn't have hear, so you know, kept running. But the wolves were probably behind her, and, and she was uh, short, small, large size, help, stop, stand your ground, confront the danger. I, I mean, you know, if you're in Yellowstone, Gosh darn it, it's a, it's a natural area, you know, avoid the earbuds while you're out hiking. Uh, at least forego them for that period of time. So if nothing else, you can hear the bird song, but you can also hear oncoming wildlife. So, you know, you know if something's sneaking up behind you. Um, that's kind of just general weariness that works uh, in a national park. Um, I thought Abby's discussion about dogs was very good. Dogs are an attractant. Um, you know, there, there's, I just read a book uh, on, on how wolves evolved from dogs, and this particular author is making an argument that they should be the same species. So that's how closely allied they are. Whether that argument is valid or not is another debate, but suffice it to say, there's a whisker of a distance between a dog and a wolf, and so wolves will respond to a dog like they do other wolves which is either an attractive or competitive relationship. So the regulations in the park are a little bit different. Uh, dogs are required to be on leashes. They're not allowed off roads. They're not allowed on developed areas. And you do that, you're fine. You're fine. I ski at Jardine with my dog. I see wolf tracks. I don't freak out. I don't worry. But I am paying more attention. And it does restrict total freedom of what I can do with my dog in areas that don't, it aren't wolf country. And that's just the price of having wolves, is you don't get to do whatever you want all the time. Uh, God forbid that humans can't do whatever they want all the time. Um, but uh, that's just the price of living with wolves. Um, I think that's it, because Carter will need the most time. Uh, oh, but we, we uh, will, um, you know, what we're moving in now is, right now, with the Jump to Cute situation, we're trying to do paintballs on them. Uh, bean bags, rubber bullets, cracker shells, all those tools Abby mentioned um, is what the situation we're in because of that exposure to pups on the trail this summer. And so in the future, can we prevent these situations? I don't know. It's going to be really hard. Wolves are naturally curious. That's what's made them evolutionarily successful, is that curiosity leads to learning about the environment and living in the environment better, uh, but it also leads to these kind of problems. They learn, hey, that person's not bad, and so I don't need to avoid them. And these pups right now are playful, that's why they run off with tripods. Um, so that behavior can lead them 
in the wrong direction. And so we, as people in this room, have to deal with it. So I'll leave it at that. Um, and if, there's, if I left something out, you can hit it in the question and answer period. Um, you're asking, are there ways of closing off denning areas for WIS the way we have closed off their management areas to protect the dens? Yes, uh, that is a that's that's probably our best management solution, and so we do try and do that. For example, the wagon road uh, leading back to uh, Silvertip Ranch this summer was closed to no off trail hiking. Very difficult to close that trail off completely, like no human use, because it's such a popular trail. Uh, and so that um, is feasible, but without completely closing the trail, it didn't work. Uh, you know, the, the pups came right to the trail and walked up and down it. And so um, there's a lot of give and take on how much closing we can do. We have, I won't give specific examples, but you know, one misnomer about Yellowstone Park is there's no livestock there. You know, we've got, uh, I don't know what the count is, but probably on a summer night over 100 horses, maybe 150 horses, 200, out in the backcountry every night, and we've had virtually no problems with wolves. That, that doesn't mean there's been none, and we've requested closures on some of those backcountry campsites and been denied. They're, they're too popular. There are fee areas where people have to reserve them, so you can't do them. So uh, I think all of us who work with Wolves and Yellowstone think closures are the best tool. Banff, by the way, stressed to me that they, they are very into closures, and they've enclosed entire valleys. Um, and their policy, Banff administrators are more receptive to complete closures. Um, however, they get tons of violations. So the area is closed. And all, we, we all know human nature. <laughs> we all break the rules, apparently. And so these closures, are, it all takes is a handful of people to break the rules and the whole thing goes down the drain. Uh, so I mean, we, you know, this, this kind of responsibility that's on us, the self-policing, but uh, I think your suggestion is right on. That is the best. And you know, we do take the approach that, you know, what are parks for? I mean, there are four people in wildlife, but they're one of our last strongholds of pristine nature, whatever's left of pristine nature. So should we give the wildlife the nod and, and give up our rights to get at everything? Um, but it's an imperfect solution, and there's blowback the other way. No, you can't close it, uh, but it's an excellent tool. Somebody else. Okay, hello, Cliff. Um, good talking here. We talk a lot. Um, I mean, I think I said it in my introductory remarks. I mean, the research we do is mostly remote. I mean, it's mostly uh, radio callers, airplane in the ground. And I would say we are doing it from a safe, respectful distance that's not leading to habituation. Um, you know, we're not going to the den and rendezvous sites while wolves are there. We're keeping our distance from them. Almost everything we do is from the road through spotting scopes. We do hike after kills, we do hike after clusters well after the wolves are gone. Um, but, you know, we, I think, are adhering to what you like and it is a park regulation, which is the wildlife gets the respect and the distance uh, and the protection. Uh, I mean, that's our most fundamental goal. And, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot, and I know you feel this way. And it's something that we'll have to continue to talk about. But um, no, uh, I do not think we're leading to either habituation or disturbance with our research activities because we're doing it respectfully and in a remote fashion. And so, again, I, I know this is a sensitive topic for you. I'm happy to talk to you about it as much as you want, but maybe when you come into my office next. So for wildlife to live here, they've got to know how to live, you know, be with people all the time. And so those wolves aren't going to flee and run every time they want to cross the road uh, or walk somewhere. They're going to be, you know, within rifle shot of people um, and not worry about it. That's one reason we're worried about, you know, they get confused in the park. 
they're tolerant of people out of the park. If they have that behavior, they get killed. And so that's a big thing, and Abby and I talk about that a lot, because they don't know where the line is. And so, but tolerant isn't a human safety threat. It's not hooking on to people. It's not habituation. But, you know, and if we hit wolves with rock salt every time they did that, um, they'd be confused. It would be not a teachable moment, and it wouldn't be achieving the objective. And so, um, but when an animal does show this kind of, and it's a very small number of wolves, that show the full habituated behavior, we do hit them hard. It's not with rock salt, but it's with similar munitions that hurt like hell, but don't kill them, and try and teach them to be respectful and wary of people. So the short answer to your question is we do do that in the appropriate circumstance when the wolves show improper behavior. But it's, it's got to be defined in that fashion. And wolves are responding to human pressure. There's no question. And then other packs aren't because they get so much human pressure, they get used to people. Uh, and so there's kind of two different, and those are cued by locations. So the locations where there's a ton of, of, of observations, those packs are more tolerant of people, and the other places there's not, they're avoidant of people. So we already know that human pressure is occurring, and that the packs are dealing with it differently. My favorite pastime now is going out in the summer camping with wolves, getting as close to them as we can without, uh, you know, talking about habituating them. You don't want to get in there so friendly that they start living with you and thinking, hey, you know, this is cool, uh, these, these people are friendly. Uh, we watch them from a distance, we don't let them get close. Um, it's easy to say a fed bear is a dead bear, but a fed wolf is a dead wolf too. So. Uh, Keep your distance, but uh, my God, enjoy them. They're they're the coolest animal on earth, in my opinion. And I've had to, I had to come at this from both ways, you know, working with them, researching them, and killing them sometimes too. But anyway.